All right. Good morning. How is everybody today? So we were talking about last time um, psychographics is where we where we left off. So the influences on why we buy the things that we buy. And if you will go to Strategic Business Insights, I gave you this address, and I think I told you that you can get on. Obviously, all of the PowerPoints are on B2L in um, Module 2. So if you'll get on and you'll do the Strategic uh, Business Insights and you'll take the profile test and figure out where you are and then show me some proof of it, I'll give you participation points for that. So you can get five participation points for doing that. I know some of you have you know less than... than uh, um, comfortable talking in class. I realize that a lot of people are kind of shy. Most people say that they would rather go to the dentist than talk in a public setting. I don't understand that. I wanted to be a country and Western superstar, but I'm a tone deaf, flat baritone. So I had to become a college professor instead to have some kind of um, audience that I could, you know, stand up in front of and, and get some feedback. Yeah. Um, I did one yesterday. Okay. Just, um, but I said I wasn't going to get like an email with the results. So do I just take it again? Yeah, just take it again and take a like take a screenshot of it. That's that get that gives your vowels type, and I'll give you the points okay. for it. All right. Um, you can do that. You can bring it to me on Tuesday uh, if you haven't done it already. If you've done it, and you have some kind of uh, screenshot or something. Just come up and let me know, and we'll, we'll give you the participation points for that. It's in, it's helpful because it really is one of the most scientific predictors of the way people will, will choose what they choose um, based on, on um, a couple of factors, your motivation and then your access to resources. So what um, Val's looks at is whether or not you have high access to resources. In other words, you have a lot of income or money and and potential, or you have low access to resources, and then whether or not you are motivated by ideas, by achievement, or by self-expression. So each of these then is uh, is a different lay is is labeled uh, according to that type. Innovators are motivated by all three, and they have high access to resources. And then at the bottom are survivors, which have low access to resources and maybe don't necessarily fit into any of the other three columns. So we'll talk a little bit about each one. And what I want you to think about as we do this, as we go through here and I describe it, so I'm going to give you a heads up now so you can start thinking about it. Start thinking about restaurants and what kinds of restaurants each of these types would like based on the characteristics that we discuss. So um, don't shout it out. Please raise your hand so that I can get everybody who needs to get participation points. I didn't say that last time. It, it's hard for me if you just shout out to figure out who's saying it and then to sort of give everybody the points that they want. So please raise your hand. Think about these as we, as we talk about what motivates them. So innovators are motivated by all three, ideals, expression, achievement. They seek enormous amounts of information. They're constantly looking and reading and researching. They are, because they have access to resources, generally highly educated, and they're skeptical about advertising. They don't believe what they hear in an ad just because it's put in an ad. I think I told you all that I have a, uh, an employee that worked for us and my mother, you know, she said, well, it's on YouTube. So if it's on television or if it's on YouTube, it's got to be real. And my mother was like, Grant has a YouTube channel, Amanda, like nothing I could say could possibly be uh, relevant, but she's, you know, she's influenced by, she thinks that if you, if you have these things, if you're on television or if you have a YouTube channel, that, that you must um, have some legitimacy, not realizing that, you know, the, the internet is other than the opportunity cost of not being able to do what it is, you know, maybe making money or hanging out with friends. If you're sitting on, on your YouTube channel, uh, live streaming, or if you're out there promoting conspiracy theories on Facebook or, you know, some of the other, um, ones that have popped up, there are now 
for those that are being pushed off of Facebook and being pushed off of Twitter, there are what they call alt-right sites that allow you to have these same sorts of discussions that before they were having on sort of the more mainstream platform. So if you're doing that, you're giving up obviously something because you're not hanging out with your family or your friends. There's an opportunity cost there. But that opportunity cost for most people is very low in order to be able to, to put stuff out there. So innovators are extremely skeptical of all of that. They're, they're going to look for credible sources. They're not going to view advertising as legitimate. They're very future oriented. They're constantly thinking about the next thing, the next move, and how they're going to make more money. A lot of these people are entrepreneurs. They have a wide variety of interests and activities. These are what we might think of as being sort of Renaissance people. One of the things historically that college has been about has been about transforming you into a well-rounded person. If you go back in time, colleges of business are a relatively contemporary phenomenon compared to th other things. Historically speaking, you didn't go to college necessarily to get a job. That was the arena of vocational education to teach you a skill or something. College was about historically, uh, you know, making you into a well-rounded person. I mean, if we go back way back to the first institutions of higher education, they, they, they come from um, the oldest profession, which is the clergy. In the Western tradition, they originate largely as a way of transmitting knowledge to the clergy. So the three sort of historic professions that make up the reason people went to college were uh, the clergy, which is the oldest, law, and medicine. And so they, they were tied to a profession, but most of those people in those things don't really view it as a profession. I don't really view being a lawyer necessarily as being a profession, but more as a calling. So if you, if you read a book called, I think it's Habits of the Heart, they talk about various types of ways that we earn money. The lowest form is just a job in which your identity has very little attached to that activity. It's just a way of providing for the basic human needs that you have. The next, which is what most of you want, and the reason that you're here in college, is you want a career. There is some identity wrapped up in what it is that you do to make money. One of the things, and I tell students this, and particularly in my sales classes, one of the first things that people will ask you when they meet you at fashionable parties, you know, cocktail parties after five o'clock and things like that, is what do you do? And I tell people, and I tell students that people don't ask you this question because they really care about you, but because it's almost an instant way of sort of pegging where you are on the social ladder. Whether or not you're sort of, you know, upper, middle, lower, working class. And as Americans, we have a tendency to think that we don't have a class-based system, and we don't to the extent that you have, for example, in Great Britain, where if you're not sort of born into the upper class, you'll never achieve it. And it has very little to do with money. It has more to do with, you know, social structure. In the United States, we still have a class system, but it's based more on achievement. It's based on your education level and your occupation and things like that. And so people will ask you this question, what is it that you do? And, and that sort of pegs you instantly. It also provides a way of creating conversation between people that don't know each other. Because you can ask about that. My mother used to say when she was an English teacher, um, before she became an entrepreneur and started a lot of businesses, that she hated it because you'd go to a party and people would say, what do you do? And she'd say, I'm, I'm a high school English teacher. And they would say, I hated English in high school and, and walk away. But what do you know about that? Well, you know that to be a, a, te a teacher, you have to have at least a bachelor's degree. And that is uh, a learned profession and, and things like that. 
So innovators have this most broad variety of activities and, and what we might think of as being this renaissance individual. And that's largely what the bachelor's degree historically has been about, is about trying to get you to understand things. And I have a lot of students that will say, particularly my sales students, when we go to competition and when you go to competition, you learn a lot about people and they'll say, you know, why is it that I have to take a physics course? That's not, I don't have any interest in that. What, what is it that I need to know about physics? And the truth of the matter is from a daily perspective, not a lot. Why do I have to take calculus? How is that really going to influence my life? Or algebra. And again, if you're an accountant or a marketing professor, you're probably not going to use a whole lot of that on a daily basis. I mean, the math for accounting is fairly straightforward. It's not um, looking at, you know, advanced structural equational modeling or things like that for the most part. But there's something about having that exposure to allow you to become uh, educated in sort of a whole sense. And that's what the bachelor's degree historically has been about, is this sort of thing. And, and so innovators are, are ones, and you'll find this in, in companies. Um, years ago, they did studies of, of Fortune 500 CEOs, and they found that most of them didn't have business degrees to start out with. They had the MBA, and the MBA historically was a degree for people who didn't have a business background that were in business. It's not a substantive degree the way I have a master's uh, of arts in political science. That was a substantive degree. The MBA was about giving you a broad base of knowledge if you were a business executive, like my sister who went to Boston College and got a degree in English. And she, she used that degree to get into a sales and marketing role with Honeywell and when she reached the level of director, she wanted to become a vice president. And they said, well, you have to have an MBA if you're going to become a vice president. So she went and got the MBA. That's historically what the MBA has been for, is for people like that who didn't necessarily have the bachelor's of business administration. And so a lot of these Fortune 500 CEOs actually had liberal arts backgrounds. And that sort of makes sense if you think about it, because as, a, as an executive, you're maybe not necessarily thinking, if you're the chief executive officer of an organization, you're not necessarily thinking about the minutia. You're planning out and thinking about what you can bring. And we'll talk about this when we talk about product development, things to market. So they have a wide variety of interests and activities. You'll find these people engaged in sports activities and also going to the, the museums for cultural events. And the symphony and uh, plays and musicals and all of that. They're, 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 they cast a wide net. So thinking about this in terms of Oklahoma City restaurants, who has an idea of what kind of restaurant would be attractive to innovators? Race? Fine, fine dining. Maybe. Okay, what's a fine dining establishment that might be? Vast. Okay. Why do you think fine dining? <laughs> And what do you define as fine dining? You said vast. What do you think of? I'm going to ask you a question, but I'll come back. I'm going to start with you. What do you think of as fine dining? What what makes something fine dining? I don't know. Like you sit like um, it's just like a nicer like restaurant with like fine service and like you walk into a hostess, they'll seat you, and I don't know like. A steakhouse or something. Okay. Red Prime is a steakhouse yeah. uh, in the automobile alley area. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, pretty good. I think that's that's correct. You, you, you don't just walk in and sit down. Mm -hmm. You have to, in some of these, you have to have reservations. When I was growing up, there were still restaurants that you had to wear. If you were a gentleman, you had to wear a coat and tie to get into. There was one, I think it's long since gone out of business, over off of I-44, um, right at the I-44 and I-35 junction, and it didn't advertise. You had to know it was there. It was called the Haunted House, and they wouldn't let you in without a, I mean, even if they had no business, you weren't coming in if you were a gentleman without a coat and tie. Now, if you were lucky, they could loan you a coat if you didn't have one at the door, but you had to have the tie. So why did you say Vast? What, what is Vast, and why did you pick it? That's the... Uh upper restaurant in the Devon Tower. 
Okay. And uh, I know it's pretty pricey. I think it's about $180 per plate. Okay. Per so per it's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not yeah. just serving the it's burgers and fries yeah. or fish and chips. Yeah. You, you might get something like Coco Vaughn, right? Something like that. I don't know if they serve Coco Vaughn. I've been to Bass one like, time. I haven't been, but I know they serve like rack of lamb and stuff like that right you can't get uh, yeah. i i don't know if they do I, i'm going to take your word for it because i don't remember what i had when i went to bast it was for somebody's one of my friend's birthday parties he wanted to go there and i don't remember rack of lamb being on the menu but i don't like i don't particularly like lamb i grew up on a cattle ranch and so i, I think cattle is where it's at i think lamb kind of tastes odd it's got a gamey smell to it, I think it tastes good. I but like that's not something that you get what i like lamb i think it tastes good you like lamb I do too but it's you know I don't, I don't know it's one of those things yeah. um i've tried lots of different it's game good. i was my grandfather was a, a big hunter uh growing up in new mexico we hunted uh deer and elk uh, antelope antelope is probably a, a wild game my favorite because it's got the most mm -hmm. mild um, elk and deer can both have a sort of gamey. I don't mind deer if it's put in, in like chili or something like that, but I'm not big on deer steak. It's, it's got a wild flavor to it. We used to go hunt wild turkey for Thanksgiving and it's just a mess. It's, it's hard to clean. It's difficult. It's, and it's doesn't taste like butterball. And they have, they have genetically modified turkeys through selective breeding to have a very mild, you know, not gamey, sort of bland, bland flavor. So I think you're right. I think Fast is a restaurant that would be attractive to innovators. They also like to try new things. And so you know, maybe they go to Vast one time and then they're on to the next thing. When they first started having sushi in, in Oklahoma, when I grew up, it was definitely a meat and potatoes type of town, Oklahoma City was. And I remember the first sushi restaurants that opened up and I thought raw fish, that'll never last here, but, but it has, and we've now got vegan restaurants in Oklahoma city. I thought that one would never last either. Who wants a vegan restaurant, but people do. And there are people, you know, I've got a, an employee who works for me who is now a vegan and uh, I'm trying to come up with, you know, various, cause we feed everybody lunch and, come up with various recipes that, that I can try. I've actually started making vegan food, much to my horror, because I am definitely a meat eater. You had a comment? Yeah, uh, right next to Boston is also mahogany. Mahogany's, yeah, that's another, it's a really nice steakhouse. Everything is basically there, as I recall. I've been there as well, a la carte. So it's everything, you know, if you want, you get salad is a different price. Uh, your entree is a different price. If you get sides with the entree, it's, you know, it's an additional charge. So it's all, you know, um, it adds up. And if you have drinks on top of that, well, you know, there you go. You're, you're looking at over a hundred dollars a plate, uh, for dinner. Yeah. yeah I was saying, uh, Fave is on over on the street is a prime example. Uh, they seek lots of information by the plan out their uh, course menu by the season and they're skeptical about advertisement because they don't really need to advertise. They said their clientele is loyal enough and the word of mouth gets around. Mm -hmm. They're future oriented, I guess, because they plan out their uh, menus and I guess the wide variety of, of interests and activities is that they change up what the menus are. Yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of um, these restaurants. I mean, one of the things when I told my committee that I was going to be coming back because I had a vested teacher's retirement here in Oklahoma. Um, they were horrified. I, I went to get my PhD and I talked to them at OU and I didn't want to leave the state because I owned a home in, in Edgemere and I wanted to see if I could possibly continue to work. And I went to OU and they said, well, we'll admit you, but we hope that you're interested in logistics and transportation because that's what the focus of our department is. And I thought, yuck, I can't think of anything more boring than studying logistics. It's kind of the oldest subfield of marketing in many respects. That's how we got started was with agricultural economists. I've told you this before, looking at things. And then they said, and we hope you don't um, intend on staying in the state because we try to produce scholars that go to R1 institutions. UCO is not an R1 institution. We have one R1 institution in the state and that's OU. 
And if you get your PhD from OU, they're not going to hire you back. And that's just sort of the way it works. You, you get a PhD somewhere and they generally speaking, don't hire their own back unless they go out somewhere and have experience and then maybe come back at a, at a later point in time. That's, that's just typical of, of academics. The idea is that it's inbreeding. If you hire your own people back, you're not, you're not going out and getting fresh ideas and sort of creating and contributing to the body of knowledge. So I, I was coming back to Oklahoma and I got the job at UCO after my, uh, my PhD and my, my committee who I told, that's the reason I went to New Mexico state. Cause I told them that I wanted to come back to Oklahoma. All of a sudden they get like horrified and they're like, well, we thought that since you had worked at a university and been general counsel and taught for a long time, that you would be going to an R1 institution. And I said, no, I told you I need to go back to Oklahoma. And they couldn't fathom why anyone would want to come to Oklahoma City. And so I actually invited my dissertation chair to come here. And so he brought his family. And after he came here, he's like, yeah, I can understand why you like it. There's a lot going on. I mean, we have a, a river walk in downtown Oklahoma City that's bigger and longer than the San Antonio River Walk. Any kind of cultural activity that you want to do, any of the major traveling, big production stage shows will come to Oklahoma City and be at the Civic Center Music Hall or someplace like that. And, and we have fantastic restaurants. I mean, we have incredible sushi here. You can get great sushi. You can have all of these um, restaurants that have popped up that are that are, I think are attractive to innovators like you were suggesting are ones that do a local kind of, they source their, their food locally, right? So they're going to the farmer's markets and they're going and, and finding small producers that will, will supply food, fruits and vegetables and, and meat products and things like that to them. And you can do all of that in Oklahoma City. You can now, as I said, you know, go to a vegan restaurant. I, I think the first one that I remember opening didn't last very long, but there's now, you know, a, a strong percentage of the population out there that are, even if they're not vegan, they're willing to, to go try it and eat there and maybe, you know, have meatless Mondays or something like that, which again, growing up, when we moved to Oklahoma in 1986, that would never have, have flown. That just, that wouldn't have worked. But Oklahoma City has really undergone sort of a cultural renaissance. When I moved here, you wouldn't be caught downtown in downtown Oklahoma City after five o'clock because it was full of you know homeless people and vagrants and it was kind of a dangerous place. And now you go down there and it started with one restaurant in the sort of warehouse district of Oklahoma City. And then they got the maps project and all of the uh, river walk and all of those improvements. And now it's it's kind of this cool place to go um, for entertainment and sporting events. We now have a, a major league team, which was a big deal. I never thought that you would ever pry people away from OU football because Oklahomans just love OU football. But I was on campus corner when the Thunder first came to town and all of a sudden all of the shops that had all nothing but OU football for years and years and years in their window were, were carrying Thunder basketball. Uh, items and so it's it's really transformed in many respects the quality of life that we have in Oklahoma City and my my dissertation chair was like yeah I can see why this is attractive it's it's a not a bad place to live there's a lot going on here um, there's a lot of museums the you know sort of the cultural district and the entertainment district between the zoo and Remington Park and um, the Cowboy Hall of Fame or the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, as it's now called. So all of these kinds of things, interests and activities are things that appeal to innovators. And they like to try new stuff. Thinkers. So thinkers have high access to resources and they're highly normative. Highly normative means that they sort of believe in the rules. A lot of these people fall into my parents or my grandparents' age demographic. Highly educated, but highly normative. They, they learn the rules and they respect the rules. When I was a kid growing up, 
we, we went to the country club and every Wednesday night they had family night at the country club in the fine dining room that they normally didn't let kids into. And it was training for everybody's children. You had to wear a, a coat and a tie and your, your mother sat there and it was white tablecloths and linen napkins and said things like, put your napkin on your lap, use the correct fork, right? There's shrimp forks, salad fork, dinner fork, dessert forks, soup spoons, teaspoons, you know, there's butter knives, steak knives. You had to, you had to learn which of these was the appropriate one. If you want to, to see a good example of that, watch Pretty Woman and watch the restaurant scene. Actually, before the restaurant scene, when she, she talked to the manager of the hotel, he's trying to help her um, sort of fit in to the Richard Gere character's world. And he's saying, you know, you count the times, three times shrimp fork, four times salad fork, five times dinner fork. And understanding that kind of thing. And that was very important to my parents. It was very important to my grandparents. You didn't, you didn't go when I was a kid. My father, um, my mother's Jewish and my father's Roman Catholic. So I always say the Jews invented guilt and the Catholics perfected it. So I went to Roman Catholic schools growing up and you didn't go to temple or to church in jeans and flip-flops. That just was like, my parents would have just died if, if I had ever suggested that. that. That was just not at all acceptable. That's normative, follow the rules. Now, all of these churches, you know, the sort of Joel Olstein gospel of wealth, yow yow, um, by the way, he has no theological training, right? I mean, I, I just, he comes on the television and I want to scream every single time because I, I, I'm not sure that, you know, this is my Bible. Yeah, have you, have you read it, Joel? It's, it's not just about reading it. It's also the struggle to understand that that's important. Um. And so, you know, these sorts of normative ideals, you didn't go to a wedding or a funeral in jeans and a polo or a t-shirt. People now go to, I mean, I, I, I've gone to weddings and it's like, wow, I'm just amazed at what people will wear. That would have, like my grandmother would have been turning over in her grave if you showed up in you know jeans to a wedding so they're highly normative they plan they research and they consider things they can uh, suffer from analysis paralysis to some extent i tend to do this when i when i buy a major item i start with the notebook i, I start collecting data from things like consumer reports as to what what it is that i need and want Thinking about microwaves, for example, when I was a kid growing up, again in, in the late 1970s, microwaves were a relatively new phenomenon at that point. I think they've been around since the 50s, but they were very expensive. They had these dials on them. You've never actually seen these. You open the door, you shut it, and then you had a power setting dial, which was either like high or low, as I recall. It may have had a medium. And then you turned another dial for, you know, one, two, three four minutes, whatever. And it didn't have a turntable in it at that point in time. They cost $1,000, which was an astronomical amount of money in the late 1970s. And we had one and, and you put, they were really only good for like heating up water because they didn't have a turntable. Now microwaves are this plethora of options. So when I needed a microwave, I started getting the book out to, you know, like compiling the notebook of, what is it that we want? What kinds of features can you have on a microwave now? Well, there's popcorn features. And I was, do, you, do I really need the popcorn feature? I hate popcorn. It's, it's just dry and kind of disgusting and it gets stuck in your teeth. I, I've never been a big popcorn fan, but you know, that's a feature. You just stick the microwave popcorn in there 
and hit the popcorn button and it's supposed to you know come out with the exact time period that you need for the major brands of of popcorn they have you know features where it will just if you hit one two through six it automatically is one through six and you can hit the start button you know i mean they, they come with all these different types of things one microwave that i was looking at at this time and i think they've taken it off the market was not just a microwave but it was also a toaster so you could like you know, heat things up and then get them so that they weren't soggy afterwards. So I start compiling this, this list in this notebook and I come home and my spouse at the time had bought the microwave. And I was like, where did this come from? Well, we needed a microwave. So I went to Walmart and bought it. Well, why did you choose this model? Did you consider the list? Did you consult the notebook? No. Well, how did you select it? Well, it matched our other appliances. No, that's not the way, you know, like that's not the way you should go about making decisions. But these people will have analysis paralysis because that's what they'll do. They'll think about all of the various options that you can have and do sort of that, what we think of as being mm -hmm. traditional consumer behavior research. They have a historical perspective. So they have a tendency to look to the past and think that the past is prologue for what's going to happen in the future. They're financially independent. They're not influenced by fads. There's a big difference between fad and fashion. What are some of the fads that are, you know, popular today? Crocs. Crocs. You think that's popular today still? It is. Definitely. Definitely. They're insanely popular again. You've got to be kidding me. Got to go over. <laughs> I, I thought that we had gotten over these. I, I, I thought we had moved beyond the Crocs. Yes. Sweater vests. Sweater vests. Are sweater vests popular? Back home they are. Where do you, where's back home? Vegas. Why would a sweater vest know. be popular in Vegas? I mean, if you told me you're from Minnesota, no. I could understand why a sweater vest would be popular because it's cold in Minnesota. It's the great white, but Vegas is hot and dry. I mean, I, I think, you know, I would think the things that would be popular in Vegas would be like shorts and, you know, Orvis t-shirts or something like that. But okay, sweater vests. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a big fad person. Um, historically, I have always worn uh, suits and ties to teach in. And one of my colleagues keeps saying, when, are, when, are, when is the bow tie? That was what I was known for. And that's what I'm known at as competition is the bow tie guy. Because I have like 150 different bow ties. You're going to make a comment. I was just going to say maybe like boot cut jeans. Boot cut jeans. Okay. I think that is um, maybe a fad, particularly here in Oklahoma, where we have a lot of country and Western, you know, dance bars. Is there still one down on Meridian? in the big warehouse, is that one still, it used to be called Club Rodeo and they had live bull riding in there? I think so, there. I think so. It's still probably open. I don't think it's called the same thing, but I don't think it's closed down. You know, there, there's forever um, on Reno, there was Graham's, which was a very popular country. I think it's closed and gone out of business, but, but I'm not sure. But that's, you know, boot cut jeans in Oklahoma is popular because we sort of have a cowboy culture here. Um, that's not necessarily a, a fashion. Uh, so yeah, really big one's probably Pokemon. Anything and everything Pokemon. Yeah, I think that's true. My nephew loves. We spend an enormous amount of time running. He likes to come to Guthrie because there's usually Pokemon cards in the Guthrie Walmart, so he can actually get Pokemon. But we spend in, in Dallas. It's hard to find Pokemon, and I do not understand what this is all about. And he's like, "Well, you can play a game with him," and I'm like. Do you play the game with them, Carson? He's like, no, I just collect them. Sort of like people used to collect baseball cards. That was a big fad when I was in high school. There were baseball card shops all over the place, and people traded baseball cards. And you know, if you to this day, I think if you have like a Mickey Mantle baseball card, it's still worth quite a bit of money. But that's something that's gone uh, away in terms of its popularity. That's a fad. Fashion, on the other hand, tends to be more stable. I think that. You know, 
the since the Kennedy era of the 1960s, um, that sort of traditional cut suit, the presidents tend to wear, if, if you look at presidents um, from you know Kennedy on, they all tend to wear sort of the same thing. It's a white dress shirt, a red or blue tie, and either a two or three button single breasted, you know, black or blue or pinstripe suit. That's just sort of classic. It's never going to be like, you know, in, 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 you know, the passing fad of the day, which the passing fad has gone from at one point in time when I was in high school, um, Zoot Suits came back. There was actually a uh, like a um, song, Zoot Suit Riot, and they came back. So Zoot Suits are these kind of long jacketed, baggier, looser fitting suits. And that that's a fad. And, you know, it came and it lasted for about a year. And then after the song was no longer popular, I think it went out. So, but if you look at the president of the United States, they have a tendency to, to whether they're Republican or Democrat, if you look at the way Joe Biden dresses, it's just sort of, you know, um, they all wear the same uh, American flag lapel pen. That's just sort of, sort of standard fare. So they have this historical perspective not influenced by fads because fads are not historical. They come and they go. One of the things that was a fad when my mother was going through college was bell-bottom jeans. And I think they're absolutely hideously ugly. I mean, here these people were in the middle of a sexual revolution wearing clothing that, that was just not attractive. And guess what's back? There are people, I've seen them wearing these bell-bottom jeans again. And I'm just like sort of horrified by that. Apparently, the high-waisted jeans have come back as a fad for uh, women. The Yeah, the ones that come up to your belly button. That, and I'm just like, those, those were ugly in the 80s. Why are we, why are we doing this again? Why is this, why is this come back? Yeah. Um, another one I would say would be like overalls. Overalls? Yeah, I used to, my mom used to dress us in overalls when I was like in elementary school. And now I see them like at the store. Yeah, Oshkosh were big when I was a kid for, uh, for kids. Oshkosh Bagosh. Yeah. Those were, were definitely popular. Big chunky boots. Big chunky boots, yes. That is, that is definitely a fad. When I was growing up, cowboy boots were all. Um, rounded toe. They didn't have this like squared off toe, which I think is really, really hideously ugly. Uh, dress shoes have also gone through that at one point in time. They were the big chunky sort of like industrial black patent leather dress shoes went through that phase. And I think that, you know, those are ugly. Allen Edmond, which is what I wear uh, most of the time, tend to be not fads. They're a, they're a fashion. They've, they've stayed the same. They're good quality shoes. They've been made in America. That's one of the reasons they're more expensive, and they're not a they're not a fad. They're they're um, they're a fashion item. People wear Allen Edmond. They they send them back to. I've got to send these. These are Allen Edmond shoes. I've got to send them back to be resold um, again. And this is like the third or fourth time that I've had that done. So they they tend to last. You send them back, and they they redo them for you and recondition them. Yeah. Um, one that I've seen is like Antifax in high school. I would see Antifax all the time. Yeah, that was also very popular when I was in high school. And then it became the height of uncool and nobody would wear them. And now people have started wearing them again. And I again wonder like what is what is going on with uh, the fashion today? So they like traditional in intellectual pursuits, reading. They're big readers. I know my students today tell me this is one of the reasons why most of you are probably not thinkers. Reading makes me sleepy. Let's see if I can get the camera to move back over here. Yeah, come on, come back. It's supposed to follow me and it's not. So they like to, to read uh, and they like reading things like biographies or histories are big for them. They like proven products. 
There was a book that came out when I was in college called The Millionaire Next Door. And these researchers in a, a business school invited all of these people who were millionaires to come and they had the event because they were going to interview them and figure out how they became millionaires. And they, they had like, they laid out in this, um, it was a, sort of a, a hospitality suite at a big hotel. They laid out all of this stuff like shrimp cocktail and caviar and expensive finger sandwiches, cucumber sandwiches, and none of them touched it. These people, you know, the average millionaire next door at that time drove a Ford Taurus because that was the most popular. That was what company fleet cars were at the time. It was sort of a proven product. Most of them owned a business. They were entrepreneurs. They didn't pay a lot of money for their, their, their clothing. They bought clothing that was, was very solid and good quality, but not necessarily a fashion. And so they were surprised by this finding that that they uh, that they they weren't what they expected them to be. Mike Rowe was interviewed after on NPR after he had finished his series called Dirty Jobs. Some of you have probably seen this. And they said, what did you learn? And he said, well, one of the things I learned is that most of the people that I interviewed that did these jobs, they owned these companies. And most of them were very successful. They didn't follow their passion. One guy that he talked about was, you know, he had a, a septic tank installation repair um, business. That's, that's a horrible job. But it's something that has to be done. If you live anywhere outside of the city limits, and even if you live in the city limits, for example, my department chair lives off of 33rd, but she's got something like seven and a half acres. And though they brought city water out to her house, but they haven't brought city sewage out. So she still has, she's on a septic system. And if you go across I-35 for a, a long period of time, those developments, um, they've now I think got city services out there, but a lot of them you'll find they're on acreages and they have, they have septic tanks instead of city waste water. And he said, yeah, they didn't, nobody, nobody like dreams of this. Nobody sits there and says, I want to own a septic tank system. But most of these people who own these companies saw a need, they fulfilled the need, and they became millionaires. And it, it was not by following their passion. So maybe we shouldn't tell people, you know, follow your passion. If your passion is, and I, I say this all the time to students, one of the things that's nice about you all being in this classroom is for the most part, your business students if your passion is to go into musical theater and you get a degree, I think we have a, a musical theater degree and you want to be an opera star. How many people can actually do that? How many jobs are there for that in Oklahoma? Not a lot. There are no full-time live paid equity theaters in Oklahoma. So you know, they, they like proven products. They like traditional pursuits and, and things that are, are tested and well uh, valued. Believers, on the other hand, are like thinkers in that they're motivated by ideas, but they have low access to resources. Oh, I forgot to ask. Let's let me go back. What kind of restaurants do you think that thinkers would be attracted to? Anybody have an idea? So probably not the uh vegan restaurants but what would you think thinkers would be they have a high access to resources yeah um i was kind of thinking like cattlemen's because it's yeah i think that's a like older yeah i think that's a, a very very good it's it's expensive but their menu hasn't changed since 1950 yeah. something or other i mean it's steak and baked potato and shrimp cocktail and bread and they make their own salad dressing that everybody remembers if you've been to Cattleman's they have this really good but it's it's a, it's a sort of a standard thing and it's something that's traditional and that that I think that they would absolutely like right i mean that it's not it's not Arby's but it's also not vast or 
uh, Lou Devine or something like that. I think that's absolutely right. So low access to resources, belief in basic rights lead to the good life. And by this, I don't think we should think of the expansion of these basic rights. They, they believe in things like going to church, having sort of traditional, what we would think of as traditional Republican family values. So faith and spirituality are important to them. Mary Kay Ash started a company called Mary Kay. And it's a multi-level marketing company. And she did it for women who wanted to have a career, but were still mothers and wives. And their company sort of motto, I think, when Mary Kay was alive was God first, family second, career third. In that order. Right? And that's, that's something that believers would find uh, attractive. So they like friendly communities. One of the things that I think of, if you grew up in a small town in, in Oklahoma, like I did, Guthrie, we moved here when I was in junior high, I guess, actually. It, it's a friendly place. Everybody knows everybody in town. Now, it's started to change because we've had more and more people that have moved. But when I moved there in 1986, people didn't move to Guthrie. It had been, you know, the same sort of families that had run the town forever and ever and ever. And everybody on Sundays you could shoot a cannon off in downtown and not hit anybody because everybody was in church. Guthrie's a town of about 11,000 people and we have something like 38 churches in town. That's the kind of things that believers like. They like TV and romance novels. So thinkers are reading, you know, the biography of Earl Warren, who was, you know, maybe the most famous chief justice to, to have served in, in the 20th century for a number of landmark decisions that came out of what was called the liberal era of the court. These people don't like, like that. They like, they like Jackie Collins novels and sitcoms on television. I made comments one semester and to my horror about something that everyone should have read in high school. And because you hear these references over and over and over again to something being Orwellian or 1984. And my students all, this was probably 10 years ago, my students all had this blank look and I said, none of you have read 1984. That used to be standard reading. In, in high school, everybody had to read one of the dystopian novels. And I said, what did you all read? And one of my students said, well, our English teacher in senior year, which was supposed to be American literature, uh, had us read Jackie Collins novels. There's two problems with that. A, they're trash. And B, she's not American. She's British. I don't know why you're reading a British author in American lit. You're supposed to be reading things like, you know, Hemingway, but apparently that had gone out the window. They like stability. They view advertising, unlike innovators, they view advertising as a legitimate source of information. If it's on the TV, it's got to be real. They don't, you know, they just don't let anybody put commercials on television. Well, we kind of do. We have this idea that the First Amendment reigns supreme and people can pretty much advertise. Now, there are limits to that. The FTC limits what you can say, but they view advertising as legitimate and they are enormously brand loyal to brands that are you know, considered to be sort of, again, staples of American iconography, Wrangler, Levi, things like that. Not, not the, you know, new fashion brands. What's the jean company? I've, I've, 
it was on the tip of my tongue and I, I've lost it. They don't, they don't sell them in department stores. You take a picture of yourself and measure yourself with an app and they send you jeans that are custom made. Is it something like blue denim, I think, maybe? I'll look and I'll, I'll try and find it. That's not what they're going to buy. They're going to go to Shepler's or Boots uh, City and, and buy Wranglers. So what restaurants do you think believers would tend? You had your hand up first. I thought of like like mom and pop restaurants, like there's like a diner by my house and things like that. Like stability, they're always gonna have like the same like American food, the friendly environment. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Diners, they like they I mean it's gonna have burgers and french fries and chicken fried steak and chicken fried chicken. I had a, a, a colleague come in years ago from New York. And he went somewhere and he ordered chicken fried steak. And he said, I, it was, it was, I said, did you like it? And he said, no, it was bad. He said, they served me rancid meat. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, well, it was brown. And I said, well, what color should it be? And he said, well, white, because it's chicken, right? And I'm like, no, chicken fried steak is steak. It's beef. Chicken fried chicken is chicken. And he said, you're kidding. They, they, they fry, deep fat fry steak. And I, I said, yeah, well, it's not filet mignon usually. But yeah, chicken fried chicken is chicken. Chicken fried steak is chicken fried steak. But the, yeah, I think they, they're going to like things like that. A diner. Um, you have an idea? Like chain restaurants like Olive Garden, Apple. Okay, Cruise. I think that's right. Yeah, they're they're not all that expensive. They're stable. Everybody knows what pasta is. I think you had your hand up. Cracker Barrel. Yeah, I think that's the ultimate. Like that is in terms of a chain restaurant for believers. I think that Cracker Barrel is going to be a huge one because again, it's like a diner. I mean, it's a chain. My nephew wanted to eat there the other day, and I, I had bacon, and I've never had bacon that was bland. They, I, I have no idea what they did to this bacon, but it had no salt whatsoever. I was having to salt bacon. Like I've never had to salt bacon before in my entire life. But it's like, it's all staple foods that you'd think of as being, again, American fare, burgers and ham, but it's all like, it's like bland, chewy. I was saying like going to grow Golden Brown. Yeah, I think that's another one that they would like because it's all you can eat. You have a selection. It all tastes the same, which is sort of bland, but it's, you know, it's not exotic. It's not sushi or tofu or, you know, things like that. Who had their hand up next? You did? Yeah. Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, yeah, I think that's a big one. I tell my students there are two things when we go on competition that if you mention to me, I, I jokingly say it, I'm not really violent, but I say I will punch you in the throat if you mention two things. They are the tools of the devil, and you people seem to love them. One is Starbucks. Starbucks is the tool of the devil, and I will punch you in the throat if you tell me, I'm going to go to Starbucks. No. Horrible coffee. Tool of the devil. The other is Chick-fil-A. I absolutely despise Chick-fil-A for a variety of reasons, not the least of which it's just crappy chicken. It's not even good on white bread. It's just God awful. I would say that believers would be attracted to restaurants that allow them to put tables together and have a huge group of family and friends. Sure. Yeah, together. absolutely. Um, things where you can, you know, uh, get together and, and not spend an astronomical amount of money. Um, so I think that's that's correct. Run out of ducks. You were next. I was just going to say a previous student of yours told me to ask you about Chick-fil-A in your opinion on it. It's the tool of the devil. <laughs> like, I literally hate Chick-fil-A. I, I, it's, it's just Starbucks and Ch Starbucks is really bad coffee, horrible coffee. And, and they did it deliberately. I mean, this was a marketing ploy. In, in every blind taste test among people who know about and grade and judge coffee, Starbucks always comes in at, at less than mediocre. If you like coffee, which I like coffee, 
But if you like coffee, first of all, it should be it should be black. You shouldn't put anything in it. Um, it should be black. If if you want cream and sugar and all of that, you don't like coffee. What you like is you like warm milk, you know, that's been diluted with something that resembles a coffee-like product. And Starbucks is horrible. Chick-fil-A is god awful. I mean, it is really bad, bland chicken on horrifically bad for you, white bread, no nutritional value whatsoever. It's just awful. I mean, everything about it is just awful. It's it's just, it's uninspired food. Yes. I like IHOP. IHOP. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, again, that goes along with sort of the diner. There's a lot of value. You can eat a lot of food at IHOP. And it's going to be standard American fare, pancakes and sausage and eggs and things like that. So I think that's a, another one. Somebody else over here? Anybody else? Have... Yes. Uh, my grandparents talk about this place. It's called Aishans. Yes. <laughs> that, is, that is a staple in Oklahoma. And that, I think, would absolutely fit. It is. Now, unlike Chick-fil-A, I have to say their chicken is. Their, it's fried chicken. There are three things in, it's in Okarchi, and it's a, a place that a lot of people go to. If you haven't been to, how many of you have been to Aishans? Quite a few of you. Uh, the last time I went, there are basically three things on the menu. It's a bar. You can get fried chicken, fried okra, and white bread. Have they expanded their menu at they have all? Frito chili pie. They have Frito chili pie. Okay, that's new. The last time I went there, they didn't have Frito chili pie. But again, that's sort of an all-American thing. You can get it at the fair. You can get Frito chili pie at Sonic. That's uh, nobody in um, Germany when I <laughs> suggested that at one point because I was really craving food. First of all, you, you, it's hard to find chili in Germany, but yeah. So um, Frito chili pie. That's, oh, you've already got two. It's limited to two a day. So I think those are all good ideas. Somebody else? Yeah. I was thinking about Sunnyside. What is that? I don't know what that is. It's, it's a diner right there. It's, it's a diner? Yes. It's okay. Broadway. Broadway? Broadway? Okay. What do they have? They have it's like a breakfast. Um, I think they have pancakes, coffee. They have a lot of things. Pancakes, like coffee, coffee, eggs, yes. things like that are sort of staples. These people have a tendency to believers like breakfast. Um, that's, you know, they, they believe, again, a lot of us were told that you need to jumpstart the day, that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I'm not sure that that's true. And they like breakfast foods. I'm not a huge breakfast person. Um, but, you know, they're, they're brand loyal. So, like, I think Cracker Barrel is obviously, whoever said that was, that's a really good one. IHOP, things like that are all um, interesting to believers. Achievers have high access to resources. They have a me-first attitude, both for themselves and their family. They believe that money equals authority. This is what we might think of as the nouveau riche, or at least maybe not um, rich, but high-income producers. So they think that because they make a lot of money, that that equals authority. They tend to be goal-oriented and hard-working. They have busy schedules. Think about everybody who lives in Edmond, the land of the shallow and pretentious, where you know they have their kids in every kind of sport that you can think of, and they're constantly driving their urban assault vehicles to soccer and baseball and you know guitar lessons and practice. They believe in moderate values and the status quo. So you know, again, thinking about those kind of traditional family values that Republicans have historically tended to like, going to church. They believe in technology in so much as it adds to productivity. They are willing to try it. They're not huge tech people. Innovators, you know, I had these friends when the iPhone came out, they were the first ones to get it. And I said something like, it's going to drop in price in three months. And when it did, I said, was it worth it? And they were like, oh, yeah, it was so worth it. 
to have it for three months. When the eye, uh, the Apple Watch, it's not an iWatch. I, that was a branding mistake. I'm not sure why they didn't call it the iWatch. They were the first, you know, they, they like technology. They're on the cutting edge. That's not achievers. They will use it insofar as it adds productivity. So they like things that make their lives easier. Scheduling on your phone. Using your phone for FaceTime so that you can see your grandkids is something that they would be attracted to. When my niece and nephew were very little, they lived in New York. That's where they were born. My brother is a tax attorney for Goldman Sachs and they were born there. And all of a sudden, my mother realized that her number two son was using the iPhone as babysitting. Because he'd say, the kids want to talk to you, mom. And he'd put her on FaceTime. And then they would be running around the house. And finally, one day, she's like, where are your parents? And she's like, L, my niece said, they're downstairs having a dinner party. So they were using the technology as a babysitting device to let grandma take care of the kids from 1, 000, uh, 1,200 miles away while they were downstairs entertaining their friends. They tend to be very peer conscious meaning that they look at what everybody else is doing in their office setting and they go along with that and they tend to be professionals. So they tend to be doctors and lawyers, accountants, things like that. What kinds of restaurants do you think would be attractive to achievers? DoorDash. DoorDash, absolutely. That's not something that when we talk about survivors, they're going to even know how to do. They're, they're not going to have to know how to do the app. But yeah, DoorDash, they, they do a lot of DoorDash because, again, it's allowing for flexibility. If you've got these kids that you're trying to feed and you don't have time because you've gone to soccer practice and baseball practice. And in Plano now, my brother lives in Plano, lacrosse is the big thing. My nephew plays both soccer and lacrosse and basketball. And so my brother loves DoorDash or Uber Eats or things like that. Uh, any pizza restaurants. Pizza restaurants? Like to deliver to the kids. Okay. So pizza restaurants that deliver. Um, you can get that through Uber Eats again. Uh, pizza Hut historically has been the ones that deliver. I'm not sure Pizza Hut is all that great anymore. I think the quality has gone down significantly with Pizza Hut. I think Mugdoro, they have a like, playground for children. Okay. Um... Maybe. I mean, I, I think a lot of them have a tendency. So, for example, my brother thinks that, like, he's got to feed his kids what they think of as being healthy. I'm not sure it is. And McDonald's has got a really bad reputation for not being healthy. And so they view other things as maybe being, um, you know, better quality. I think if you talk about survivors, McDonald's is obviously going to be a good one. Yeah. I don't know if it doesn't count as a restaurant, but I think it's Starbucks. Yeah. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. The, the tool of the devil. And they, they do. And I have a friend who is very much, he's a, a, a first generation to go to college and get a career and have a profession. And he thinks that Starbucks, this is another reason I hate it, he, he, he likes Basically, what's a sausage McMuffin? It's sausage and, and cheese on an English muffin. And they have that exact item at Starbucks. And he insists, much to my horror, that, you know, it's just better quality than McDonald's. And I'm like, and he's, he's like, he uses this term, it's clean food. It's good. And I'm like, in no way, shape, or form is sausage you know, clean food. I mean, generally speaking, what we mean by the term clean food is that it's not highly processed. And there's no way you get sausage without it being highly processed. I mean, it just is not possible, but he he believes that. And he believes that it's it's better quality. And English muffin's an English muffin. And sausage is sort of, so I mean, it's hard. And McDonald's actually does have fairly good sausage, yeah. Um, I would say probably like any drive-through, those that have families, like after sports? Eating. I think a lot of them, though, they, they it's not just any drive through I don't think they do, Mc, like, my niece and my nephew will not eat McDonald's. And and their parents, so it is like, they like Starbucks because it's got a drive through They like um, 
what's the Chinese restaurant that's fast food? Panda Express. Things like, I mean, they'll, they'll do that. They won't do, they like Sonic. They, they do like, soccer moms have a tendency to like Sonic. Um, but like not McDonald's or Burger King, they just don't, they won't eat that. Because again, they don't think that that's clean food. I'm not sure that I agree with that. I was going to say uh, Payway. Payway, yeah, it's it's not. Payway is owned by, um, what's the the chain? P.F. Chang's. P.F. Chang's, yeah. Payway is P.F. Chang's fast. It's basically the same food, but it's yeah. fast and quick. You can you can get it for to go, and it's it's again they view it as being higher quality than being something like McDonald's. Panera. Panera. I think that's absolutely right. I think a lot of people like Panera. That actually started out as the St. Louis Bread Company. And their big thing when they came out was the soup bowls in the bread, the bread soup bowls that everybody thought was just, you know, this incredible thing. I'm not sure that it is. Again, Panera advertises that it's clean food. I, I, I don't know how clean, I mean, you know, a, a salad is. I mean, people think that they're having... Uh, a salad and it's healthy and I'm not sure that if you've got you know three things of salad dressing on it that it's all that clean and healthy I mean there's still a whole lot of uh, oil that's usually because it's a, a highly processed product it's usually not high grade olive oil they're usually using something that's just a vegetable oil base for it I think that's another one. That's it's fast, but it's like you got to. Sorry, um, it's fast, but it's also like they they think of it as being better quality, even though maybe it's not. There's something that's called a health halo with some of these that we think of again with Starbucks. We think because it's more expensive and it's not like McDonald's. And McDonald's has started to try and rebrand to be more like Starbucks because they were losing a huge portion of their market share to Starbucks in the morning. So what have they done? They've got the McCafe. They've got more coffee drinks that are more, maybe more attractive to people. I'm not sure that that rebranding has worked very well. What you say, uh, Chipotle? Chipotle, yeah, that's another one. Again, I don't know. My brother insists that Chipotle is healthier for you than Taco Bell, but I'm not, I mean, they've had multiple E. coli outbreaks at Chipotle. And it's still, again, it's a lot of highly, you know, saturated fatty meats. Anything that's a, um, if you look at, it's, it's, it's incredible to me that people don't realize this, but if you look at the calories in something like a wrap, if this is another one that has a health halo effect. People will say, well, I'm just having a wrap. And they think that they're consuming fewer calories because it's put in a tortilla as opposed to using the bread in Subway. And the bread actually has far fewer calories. Uh, tortillas tend to be enormously calorically dense products. But there is, again, this health halo effect that, that goes along with that. So professionals, pure conscious, they, they like things that, you know, everybody is sort of doing at the, at, at the same time. Strivers have low access to resources. They switch jobs regularly for advancement. They enjoy video games and fantasy, so Call of Duty. All of the sort of games that you can play online are big with Strivers. They tend to be fun-loving. They are centers of low-status street culture. What is low-status street culture? Hipsters are strivers. They recognize the value, for example, of education, but in many instances, some of them can't afford it. Um, they desire to better their lives, but they often have difficulty achieving this. When I went to college years ago, and a lot of people are now recognizing a lot of these hipsters that I talk to that are, you know, friends of friends, and I've got friends who, you know, I have a wide variety of friends and some of their kids are what I'd call hipsters. They have, uh, you know, the interesting piercings and the tattoos that are all spelled correctly and are viewed as artwork. 
they wear, you know, this sort of grunge look and they'll ask me whether or not they should go to college. And, and my answer is generally, well, you probably should because it gives you a better chance of having access to a career in the future, but it's become enormously expensive. When I went to undergraduate school, the state of Oklahoma paid over 50%, I think it was 60% of the bill was footed by state allocated funding through E&G um, uh, budget uh, items in the state in the state budget that went to uh, Oshri and then was distributed to the various boards of regions, um, OSU, OU, and then the Oklahoma Board of Regents of uh, the Board of Regents of Oklahoma Colleges or Borock, which is now called Rousseau. So it was pretty cheap to go to college at that point in time. My parents could afford to write the check. That's no longer the case. You're paying for about 80% of what it costs. At one point in time, it was about 90%, but because of the COVID grants, I think this year, it's actually gone back to about 20% um, is being funded through government appropriations. That's a huge difference from the state paying 60 and my family having to pay 40% to now you're having to pay 80% of that bill. And if you live on campus, which a lot of schools require for your first year, OU and OSU, I think still have that requirement that you live on campus unless you live in town and you have family in Stillwater, you have, you're required to live in the dorms. That adds to that overall bill. And so a lot of them are deciding not to go to college. I am about out of time. So we'll finish this and move on to organizational. I can get through org behavior fairly quickly and we'll move into um, segmenting, targeting and positioning, I think after that. And I think I should be able to get caught up. If you got ducks or markers, because I ran out of ducks, I gotta go get more ducks. I think somebody keeps stealing my ducks. Um, come see me, and I will give you your points. Okay.